Be aware, don't do this at home or at a museum. Also, viewer discretion is advised, there is a wardrobe malfunction. Finally, no tanks were harmed during the filming of this video. Hello everyone, we are today here at We Have Waste Fest and this is Francis Boehm, the author of T-34 Shock. And I will show you now the legendary uh, Super Mario Ostrand, that's the maneuver I, I call it, because in early war the Germans did note you take an axe, you jump on a T-34, you hack in the stuff and then throw a grenade in there to destroy the engine. And I'm trying this now to do this, but the thing is, this is a late T-34 and it was made, it was, was differently done than in early war. And Francis will then explain what is different. So I hope this goes well, else I'm, I'm gonna hurt myself. Okay. <laughs> that hurt for sure. So, okay, this would be ideal. And now I take the ax probably from Bileo, hack it in and throw a grenade in. Of course, there are louvres here, which from the inside, from the commander, could be turned down to have protection. Francis will explain to us now shortly how the louvres for, for the engine, for the radiator, could be turned inside the tank. So it wasn't actually done by the driver, like we'd expect, because the control rods were too high, it would have been above the height of, of the driver. So they're actually in the fighting compartment here in the hull. I can direct you over to this lever here. It's this lever that actually adjusts the uh, angle of the armoured louvres. They're currently in the open position, but if I was to pull that handle all the way to the back and lock it, that would be in the closed position. So now here's the main issue. This handle over here, so I go back down there, which is way more comfortable and less hurtful. So Francis, from what I know, this <coughs> access hatch was, was done differently yeah. and also some other parts. Can you show us now how it was done differently in the, in the early <coughs> war T-34? Because this was a maneuver for the early war. In the late war, this was not so common anymore because we had the Panzer Faust and other stuff. First of all, I'd like to say how impressive that was. It was quite, quite fun to watch. Um, it looked very painful as well. Yeah. So the early T-34 didn't have any of the grab handles that we see on the tank today. So none of the grab handles on the engine deck, none of the grab handles on the side, and no grab handle on the transmission hatch. The early tank's transmission hatch itself was a completely different shape. Instead of being this nice round circular hatch with a really nice big and easy to put your foot on um, hinge, it was square. So it, it, it's sort of married up with the um, uh, exhaust shrouds here and it had two diamond shaped hinges like this that made it fold down. The rear plate here didn't meet at the angle that it's currently meeting at, it was rounded off so even harder to get your foot on really and the tow hooks here weren't cast, they were, uh, well they were cast but they weren't this shape, they were triangular with a pin that went across the bottom. So all in all it was a lot harder to actually get up a T-34, all of these tubes here didn't exist. Um, so from what I've seen the Germans do in their um, uh, training videos is like you did, put your hands on the exhaust shrouds but then they put their foot physically on the hinge for the uh, rear and then they can then sort of straddle the top. Of course these would be heated, this, this would be hot when they're tanking. Incredibly hot, yes. Yeah, so, so putting your hand on this is a problem. The other thing is as you see, I got some trouble with this easy way. This thing would be moving, and of course, it would not be moving on a ro uh, on a flat road. So it would go up and down. And and if you have seen the tank moving over inside one, it's it's there's a lot of going on. And at the same time, you should also realize there would be or should be other Soviets around or something. I mean. Generally, anti-tank, uh, the, the infantry anti-tank groups, had, they have, was a group, I think, of four guys. Basically, two were assigned to distract the tank, ideally put some smoke rounds or something on the, on the vision ports, and two guys, um, one guy was attacking the tank and the other one was covering him against infantry. So, this worked, because some people say this only works if there's a tank comes alone or something. But that was very often the case in, in 1941, 1942, early 1942, 
quite often the Soviets just attacked with a small group of tanks that were not really supported by infantry or very few infantry. So these tactics worked because they drove in and the Germans could take them out with infantry. And it was still quite dangerous for the infantry and you knew, you have to know what you could do. For instance, because if you see this tank and you don't know, you, you, you're not gonna try and find out, okay, let's take my axe and hack something. If I can destroy anything, make a hole and then maybe throw a grenade in. And this was also very interesting because in, there was a tank officer going to Normandy, to the Normandy beaches in, and I think it was the, the report was from 26 June or something. And he notes, there's one major problem. Most of the army guys still don't know, can identify the tanks. In contrast, he notes for the, for the air force, it works already or for the, they can already identify the planes, but the tanks, they don't yet. And we need to enforce the training on the tank identification because it also shows all the infantry that's good in killing tanks always knows which tanks they're engaging because then you know the weak points and what you can do and want you, what you can't do. And I think this was pretty similar, of course, in 41 and 42. And you see initially when the Germans invade the Soviet Union, in their initial tank identification charts, the T-34 and the KV, KV-1 and 2 are not in, but I think already in June or I, no, I think it I think it was two weeks afterwards, I think in July or something, they issue an update on the identification chart uh, charts with the T-34 and the KVs. Do you know of any Soviet reports or something how how they dealt or knew about the Germans with the tactics and getting on and trying to destroy this? Um, it was something that they had experienced in the Winter War with against the Finns and there was a anti-infantry doctrine. Um, on the turret of T-34s there were pistol ports and especially in the 76, it had one at the very back of the turret. Other tanks other than T-34s, so namely KV-1s, T-28s, and even some T-26s, T-35s, had a ball mount machine gun at the rear of the turret, which was specifically for getting rid of the infantry that had tried to get on the top of your tank. And they actually, the nickname was the Voroshilov's machine gun, because uh, it was uh, supposedly the, the, um, the myth is that it was Voroshilov that had ordered, um, we put machine guns on the back of the tank. Uh, it was, for the most part, the infantry's job to clear their own tanks of enemy infantry. But if enemy infantry is on your tank, like you say, it's very unlikely that you've got friendly infantry supporting you. It's then the crew's job to get rid of them and it's a case of using personal weapons. So T-3476, like I say, had a pistol port at the very back of the turret. So if the turret was facing forward and they knew that there was embarked infantry on the back, it was a case of opening the pistol port, pulling your revolver through and hopefully being able to shoot and, and see. Um, it's actually quite interesting that the Soviets were issued, uh, the Soviet tank crews were issued more with revolvers than the semi-automatic pistol, simply because it was easier to stick it through the pistol port and clear the tank of uh, the enemy. Um, also, tank crews were issued grenades for the exact same reason. Uh, it's very rare, but uh, you sometimes see tank crew with a two-pouch uh, grenade pouch on their belt. And again, that was uh, supposedly for clearing infantry off your vehicle and personal defence. And about the machine gun, from what I remember, Peter from Tanker has told me that the rear mount machine guns were some kind of a relic or based on the, on the experiences of the Spanish Civil War and they could in later on. And I also know that in, in German um, guides, they, they called it specifically that you take a crowbar or something and hit the barrel as, as hard as you can because this was a specially hardened um, barrels generally and then I think they would break or the chances that they would damage were particularly high. So that was also usually addressed in the manuals. But I think it was not in the early 41-42 manual which I made a video about but I think in later videos and in later issues and also the training videos I think they are specifically mentioned. So is there anything else we have to add here or? Um, not really. I mean, what we said about the machine guns is absolutely right. It was in the Spanish Civil War. And again, so uh, a great example is the T-26s at Sesenia, which uh, was a very early battle in the Spanish Civil War. Um, I cover it a lot in my book, actually, um, talking about Soviet tactics in Spain. These tanks were sent off and they outran their infantry and they were essentially swamped by uh, nationalist forces that used petrol bombs. They weren't called Molotov cocktails at that point. Uh, embarked on the tanks to, like you say, crowbar them all up. Uh, yeah, when you watch and German training videos on how to take out tanks, they talk that, you know, the first thing they do is blind the, yeah. the Soviets. So 
get clay, mud, whatever you can, and smear as many of the um, uh, vision blocks as you can. Jam the turret ring with a crowbar if you can, or a tool. I saw the video, I think you used an entrenching tool to jam it. Um, keep the Soviet crew from being able to get out, because if they can open a hatch and shoot you, then that's not a good thing. That's gonna put a bad end to your day. Uh, and then, like you say, any kind of rear-facing machine gun or any kind of, yeah, neutralize that. Smack the barrel with a crowbar. Like you say, it's hardened steel, but if you whack it, it's, it's brittle and it can still bend. Um, so from, from a Soviet perspective, they, they knew about this and the doctrine really was just keep the enemy off your tank and if, if they're on, do everything you can to get them off, unplug all the pistol ports and, and go to town. Perfect. So thank you very much, You're Francis. Very welcome. We can shake hands again because <laughs> we don't have regulations anymore. So and thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.